Hello, good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you all so much for being here today for our session, uh, Building a Legacy, How Latino Families Can Secure Their Financial Future. I'm very happy to be here with everyone today. Um, my name is Brian Reyes. I'm the CHCI Finance Postgraduate Fellow sponsored by Bank of America. Uh, me personally, I think I'm looking forward to this session because I've spent sort of the last few years doing policy work and, and research um, on questions of, of economic policy and equity. And for me, that was driven really fundamentally by the fact that you know, my parents, uh, immigrants from the Dominican Republic, are really probably the hardest working people I know. Um, but I had this feeling, and I still have this feeling, that the mechanisms that create wealth in our country weren't uh, accessible to them um, and still in many ways are, are not accessible to them. So I'm glad we can have this conversation uh, with this great panel. And to that point, I would, on behalf of CHCI, uh, like to thank Airbnb, JP Morgan Chase, the National Association of Realtors, uh, and the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trusts for their very generous support um, and much appreciated support of this session. Uh, it is also my honor and privilege today to introduce Congressman Vicente Gonzalez, representative of the 34th District of Texas. Uh, Representative Gonzalez will be our chairperson for our session today. Representative Gonzalez is no stranger to hard work nor its rewards. The congressman earned his GED in 1985 before attending Del Mar College where he received an associate's in banking and finance. He then worked his way through college at Embry-Riddle University where he earned a bachelor's degree in business aviation. He went on to complete yet more education getting a JD from Texas Wesleyan University School of Law. And now he has the honor of serving as the elected representative of the 34th District of Texas. In the House of Representatives, Congressman Gonzalez is a member of the House Committee on Financial Services, where he sits on the Subcommittee on Capital Markets, as well as the Subcommittee on National Security, Illicit Finance, and International Financial Institutions. Uh, in other words, Congressman Gonzalez clearly is well-versed in the world of finance and financial services, and so I am looking forward to uh, hearing his perspective on this subject uh, and how we might learn a little bit more today. So without further delay, please welcome Representative Vicente Gonzalez. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, for coming out uh, early. It's a nice group, and I see a lot of, a lot of activity here to, this morning. So I commend CHCI for creating this forum uh, to educate our community in such an important issue that's impacting communities across our country. Uh, Latinos are a major economic driving force to our economy. I don't think it's, it's, it's a surprise to anyone. We knew this before COVID-19, and the entire country absolutely knows it now. Uh, each one of us has demonstrated our ability to achieve the American dream through hard work and determination and perseverance. And to be clear, our role is in, sh in shaping the future of America and the American economy will only grow if we continue to create space for our communities and the next generation of Latino leaders. But how do we secure a bright future for everyone in this room as well as the next generation? We must focus on translating our success into generational wealth building. That means educating our communities how to build wealth for not only ourselves and the time being, but future generations. We must focus on uh, getting comfortable and being well-versed on financial literacy. That means financial planning, understanding and, uh, investment options uh, that can meet today's challenges and setting ourselves up for the future. Financial literacy also means financial security, uh, which is necessary to retire comfortably and in a dignified way. Sadly, that goal is getting harder and harder for generations to come. Retirement looks different for me than it did for my parents, and I think it looks different for me to the younger generation of professionals in this country. Again, we must instill financial literacy early in life and share this knowledge with our friends and family. Another cornerstone of financial success, which I think is very, very important, is, is home ownership. And owning a home provides equity not only to you, uh, but transferable, uh, transferable e equity to future generations that you can build on. As a member uh, on the House Financial Services Committee representing a major Latino district, 
I'm focused on improving investment options and educating people on the options they have. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of investment options that many times we're not introduced to early in life. And uh, forums like this are so important to learn uh, what the possibilities are. And, and I'm focused on improving those options, providing capital to small business owners, ensuring first time home buyers, buyers have the resources uh, to secure a down payment. And, and keep building wealth through, through real estate investments and other types of other options. So how do we create a foundation for our community to achieve prosperity and financial success? We lead with conversations just like this. And we keep uh, making spaces for Latinos just like this, spaces to learn, to, to have conversations, to get to know each other, and to get to know people who are experts within our community on whether it's investing in the stock market or investing in real estate or other options. And um, so I, I wanna thank CHCI for having this very important event. Thank you uh, for having me and, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, thank you for everything that you do, both for your district and for the Latino community in general. Um, I also would like to add one more uh, note of gratitude to another sponsor, uh, Wells Fargo, in addition to our earlier list. So thank you very much, Wells Fargo, for, for helping make sure that we can have this session today. Um, to continue, it is now my pleasure to introduce our session's sponsor, Ms. Noreen Enriquez. Uh, Ms. Enriquez is the Community Impact Northeast Regional Lead with J.P. Morgan Chase. She's responsible for the program management of local strategies for the firm's $30 billion commitment to advance racial equity for Black, Hispanic, Latino, and underserved communities through increasing opportunities for homeownership, increasing access to affordable housing, growing small businesses, and bolstering individual financial health. In addition to her work at J.P. Morgan Chase, Ms. Enriquez is a member of the Adelante Women on the Move and Next Gen Business Resource Groups. Please join me in welcoming and thanking our sponsor speaker from J.P. Morgan Chase, Ms. Noreen Enriquez. Thank you, Brian, and good morning, all. Buenos dias. Um, as Brian mentioned, I am Noreen Enriquez, um, the Community Impact Executive Director at J.P. Morgan Chase, and I'm part of the team that oversees our $30 billion racial equity commitment to help close the racial wealth gap and advance um, economic inclusion. While I always love the opportunity and excitement to share more about what my team does. I want to spend the time today just sharing with you all how personal this work is for me. I have come from a family where I was the first to graduate college. Um, Brian and I also come from my uh, parents, Dominican immigrants um, as well, and the first to build a professional career in the financial services industry. And many of you may relate, but Talking about building wealth was not a conversation at our dining room table, not a conversation at our family gatherings either. Uh, so for me, it has become a core mission to help share um, the learnings and the resources that I have come to know of over the years and continue to learn um, across not just my family, but all communities across the United States. However big or small a goal might be, there are so many resources, tools, and people available to help. But the biggest hurdle that we have is helping to ensure that our communities know that the resources exist and how to access them, which is why I'm excited for this conversation. And I want to thank CHCI for making this conversation a priority today, in which I want to leave you all with one call to action before the panel begins. And that is Please continue to share what you learn as a takeaway from this conversation, as well as more broadly, what has been discussed. And specifically for Chase, um, I would like to share that at chase.com slash financial goals um, is a site available of all the different tools and resources that we have for communities to leverage um, to, to share as well. But know that this is just the tip of the iceberg. This work cannot happen alone. This impact cannot happen alone. But together, we can all help our communities secure a better financial future. 
So thank you, muchas gracias, and enjoy the panel conversation. Thank you, Ms. Enriquez. Thanks very much for, for being here and for your organization's support. We really appreciate it. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, uh, Tonancin Carmona. Ms. Carmona is a fellow at Brookings Metro. Throughout her professional career, she has worked to design and implement inclusive and equitable public policy solutions to meet the needs of historically disinvested communities, previously at the city of Chicago and now at Brookings. Her research interests include racial equity, wealth and inequality, public finance, and financial technologies. In other words, most fundamentally, Ms. Carmona is really working to, to reshape policy conversations around Latinx wealth in the United States. And so I'm certain that she'll guide us to a very productive discussion today. Please welcome our moderator, Donatine Carmona. Thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. Um, thank you so much, Brian, for that lovely introduction. If you haven't had a chance to talk with him, you should. He is so impressive and going places. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I you know, also want to thank the representative for not only his remarks, but for all of the wonderful work that he does uh, for Latino families, for all families across the country to secure our financial futures. Um, and of course, I want to thank CHCI for providing this space for such an important conversation. And last but not least, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, it's so great to see uh, such a packed room. I know I've been looking forward to this conversation, especially um, being able to hear and learn from our amazing panelists today. So um, before we get started, I actually just kind of want to turn it to them very briefly to introduce themselves and their organizations. And yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Buenos dias, Luz Maria Vergara. I'm Senior Vice President, Diverse Segments for Wells Fargo Home Lending. Hello, my name is John Jones. I'm Senior Vice President uh, with NARIC, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trust. Thank you to the Congressional uh, Hispanic Caucus Institute for putting together this very important event. And thank you to Congressman Gonzalez as well. Hey, Rafael Perez. I am a realtor and serve on the Fair Housing Policy Committee for the National Association of Realtors. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Luis Biriones. I'm um, at Airbnb, where I'm on the public policy team as a public policy manager. Happy to be here. And they are all experts in their own right. So even if you know that we're not able to answer all your questions today, like catch them after the panel. Um, but uh, before that, I also want to make a note, as she just said before I did, you know, share your findings, share what you're learning. So feel free to share what you hear or you find interesting um, on Twitter. Uh, so I think that's hashtag CHCI HHM23. Um, and so I'm happy to just kick it off a little bit and I kind of want to like set the stage a little bit because, you know, when we're talking about building a legacy or financial futures that can be a little broad, even the term wealth can be a little bit abstract. Um, so we're going to get a little professorial on y'all this morning, but <laughs> when we talk about wealth, um, really what we're talking about is what you own minus what you owe. And so that could be assets minus liabilities. And when we talk about assets, that can mean so many different things. I think the first thing that comes to mind is obviously home ownership, real estate, et cetera. But there's also you know, what you have saved in your financial institutions, your retirement accounts, stocks and bonds, um, equity in your small business. On the debt side, the liability side, which is also a component of this, it can come in the form of student loans, credit card debt, um, but on the other side, also mortgage loans. And there's a difference between good debt and bad debt. And there's also racialized dimensions of debt in that sometimes you know, some people cannot access certain types of debt, especially the good debt. And so um, I wanted to just share that to level set because I think our panelists are gonna kind of delve into some of the nitty gritty details. Uh, but the other aspect too was just to also point out that we all know this, Latinos are incredibly diverse. Uh, we, we span, you know, differences and we have racial diversity. We have immigration status differences, generational differences, um, so many wide range of starting points and lived experiences. So people will be at different points in their wealth building journey. And that's also really important to keep in mind. Um, that said, one of the first things, as I said, that people think about when they think about wealth is home ownership. And this is actually the perfect panel for this because we have a lot of folks that think about home ownership and real estate in general. And so my first question to each of you is, 
why is homeownership critical to wealth building? And I think we can start with you. Very good. Um, well, we need to uh, really close that homeownership gap. And Latinos actually, even though we're not uh, where the mainstream is, uh, 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 white, non-Hispanic, uh, we're closing that faster at a faster rate. So that's the good news. But there's still lots of um, a, a long way to go there. But it's not a coincidence that whites hold more wealth. Um, and they also have the highest home ownership rate. So it's very important because it often leads to funding college. It leads to better education often. It leads to a formation of a small business. So it's kind of the uh, cornerstone of all the other wealth building activities. It's a great question. Number one, I would say home ownership is the biggest contributor to actually building intergenerational wealth, wealth that you can pass on to the next generation. And when we look at the importance of uh, home ownership, you have to really hone in on the fact that where you live impacts the school your children are going to, uh, the type of food, the quality of food that you're going to eat. If you actually have sidewalks in your right. community, I go back at looking at how important this seminar is. I think of my grandfather who fought in World War II in Okinawa, served his country bravely, but yet could not access the GI Bill because of the color of his skin. And he had to live where the options were. And then it was the Farragut Housing Projects in Brooklyn, New York. Had he had the opportunity to live in some of these other communities to build wealth to pass on to future generations, perhaps situations would have been different for certain members of my family, notwithstanding the opportunities that are here today. The second point I think is very important when we talk about home ownership is home ownership affordability and the barriers that prevent folks from actually owning a home. So set aside the fact that we have massive wealth inequality that we have to deal with, but we also have to talk about the fact that when you want to actually build new homes and new developments, mm -hmm. sometimes it's our friends and our allies that say, wait, we don't want new development because we don't want to disrupt the character of the community. Okay. So what does that mean? That means we don't have enough uh, housing developments that actually spur that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Number two, the average construction worker in most states in this country is 50 years old. We don't have enough construction workers. And so maybe if we had a revamped, readjusted immigration process, not just for families, yeah. which is important and essential, but also for workers who actually want to come here to work or who are already here, mm -hmm. perhaps if we gave them the certification and the permits and authority to do it, we can make housing affordability uh, more available. So those are just a couple of opportunities that we need to look at. That's why it's so important to have policy experts here today looking at these issues. Absolutely, thank you so much. And I, I was gonna just say, the way that both of you just tied essentially really important concepts of the way that policy practices have translated over time to allow certain households to build wealth while excluding others. So that you know prevents future generations from building wealth. Um, and then also present public policies play a role as well. Um, I don't know if you want to contribute to this as yeah. well. So, I mean, home ownership is the cornerstone for wealth building, especially in the Latino community. But I think one thing that I've noticed in the Latino community is prevalent is it's not just the cornerstone for the family that bought the home, but the entire family. Prior to being a realtor, I was a loan officer, and I would look at credit reports that had like 15 people at one address. <laughs> Oh, that's my primo, that's my cousin, that's my deal. And the once somebody in the family becomes a homeowner, it provides stability for that entire family. Um, you know, and that echoes for generations. I think that's the, the, the first point is that it's important to note that it's not just for that individual household, but their extended family as well, especially when one comes from a family of renters that changes the tide. Um, but secondly, once somebody owns a home, having control of their affordability and affordable housing. And, you know, I, I think the current, you know, economy and interest rates and everything else has people wondering, well, what are people gonna do to become homeowners? Uh, and I think back to when my parents bought their first house in 1992, interest rates were in the sevens, and I'm like, oh, that sounds familiar. And the first thing they did, as soon as we moved in, is my uncle moved into one of the bedrooms, right? And his family, and, you know, but that's having control about, housing affordability, right? When you own your own home, you can figure out how to make it work. And I think Latinos are resilient in that way that we will figure it out and we will make it work. Um, 
And I think that, that that really opens up that door to wealth building, right? Because once you have that freedom and that flexibility and that opportunity, um, you know, the opportunities are, are endless. And what's possible that wasn't possible before. Thank you, Jose. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I agree with all the points on the importance of home ownership. I think it's, uh, to touch base and expand a bit on something that Rafael just mentioned, affordability. Um, you know, we have survey data on our hosts that suggests that 42% of hosts really use hosting as a type of affordability tool. Um, so we know that in our community, there are obviously, you know, and, and as, as you pointed out earlier, there's a wide set of people like, with different set of circumstances. But what is true of many of our hosts is that it's hosting as a way to sort of adapt to changing environments. I mean, our, our platform was really founded um, uh, from the from the, uh, the great financial crisis in 2008. Mm -hmm. You know, you had a lot of wealth destruction and kind of a shift and the ways in which people are adapting, including, you know, hosting on Airbnb plat on the Airbnb platform and others. It's just a way to sort of ensure that that affordability, that longevity, sustainability, as John mentioned, can carry on not just throughout their you know financial lifespan, but for their families as well. Absolutely, and I guess on this point too, I we start with home ownership, but and it's really important to note that most of Latino wealth is held in in their homes. Mm -hmm. There are so many other asset types. Um, so I'm curious if anybody wants to jump in on um, why or you know when it. What other asset types are important for building wealth and why? And why was that the thing that came to mind? Can I, can yeah. I jump in here? Um, so you mentioned the great recession uh, during 2000. Uh, I've been in the mortgage industry 25 years. When we were looking at our uh, portfolio and just listening to the media, they kept pointing out black, brown uh, uh, mortgage uh, holders or homeowners were the ones that were defaulting the fastest on these loans, which gave a really negative connotation to home ownership expansion to minority communities. The interesting fact is with the Latino community, the reason for that was that most of their wealth was in their home. So that's where they we put all of our um, investment. So as a community, it's important to diversify the investments, but it also is a very um, strong uh, indication of how much we value home ownership, mm -hmm. but in that case, it, it hurt us. Um, and then the optics around that were were wrong. Yeah, um, it wasn't because of um, you know not a belief in the homeowner uh, home ownership. It was because we were over investing in in our homes. Right, and there was also research that was showing the way that Black and Latino families were targeted for specific types yeah. of loans that were predatory right. and harmful for communities. So yeah. it's a super complicated topic, but it's really important to delve into because it also contributes to present day inequities as well. Right. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other thoughts on other asset types, or even if they're tied to not, maybe not say home ownership, real estate in general. Okay. I can jump in. I think to follow up on my earlier point, Owning a home gives people that financial flexibility. And I think when you look at wealth building, you know, one of the main principles of, you know, financial stability is being able to lower your costs, increase your income, and then save and invest the difference. So once right. somebody has that home, they're able to lower their costs, they're able to increase their income. And then that save and invest the difference part is where there's a big void. You know, right. I, I live in a Latino community and, and I, have to drive miles before I can find the first bank because there isn't any banks in my community, right? And I think that that's still uh, an issue nationwide where, you know, we're un under-resourced when it comes to financial resources because, you know, there, there's, there's not as much of a demand. And I think that that's something that we all need to be proactive in making sure that the resources make it into our community. And I think there's some great partners out there that are doing great work and making sure that they partner with community organizations and getting that. Yeah. A lot of them are, are here on stage. And um, you know, I, I think that that Invest the Difference part where Latino families do find that opportunity is investing in businesses. I think mm -hmm. that's the one, you know, I, I think historically I look back at my family and I, I think, okay, we're working with property and owning a home is, okay, well, that happens in, in other countries and starting a business is common. 
Um, so I, I think that people gravitate towards the familiar and, and, and either being entrepreneurial with pure real estate mm -hmm. or actually starting a business with, a, with the money that is generated through home ownership is, is one of the areas where you know, families do invest is, is in entrepreneurship. Absolutely. Prior to working in, go uh, prior to working in my current uh, position in uh, corporate real estate, I worked in government. Uh, while working in Congress, I led an investigation to the what was then, then 2017, the nascent fintech industry mm -hmm. and the impact of uh, algorithmic bias on minority and uh, women-owned companies. And this led me to uh, think more about the uh, digitization of real estate and mm -hmm. investment and so forth, which led me to, uh, to go back to school and focus on corporate real estate investment. And that's how I landed at NAREIT in the sense that I saw a space in the world where black and brown people were just minuscule in terms of yeah. the persons that I saw uh, on stage, behind the scenes, whatever may be the case. But it led me to my interest in REITs, which stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. REITs are modeled on mutual funds. Most of the folks in the world of finance know what REITs are, but basically I'm a landlord. Being a landlord is very annoying. <laughs> you gotta deal with to the three T's, toilets, trash, and taxes, right? You got to worry about the Very pipes, <laughs> pipes uh, some landlords in the building. So you have to worry about the pipe exploding in the yeah. middle of the night or, yeah. you know, all types of uh, aggravation. And with a, a REIT, it basically allows you to invest in uh, real estate projects or in real estate the same way you would invest in a company by buying stock on uh, the stock exchange. And it's a very diverse portfolio, health centers, medical centers, shopping malls, office buildings, uh, stadiums, venues like this as well as what we talk about the, the realm of prop tech, which is the intersection of real estate and technology, prop tech being short for property technology. And those are the data centers, mm -hmm. the warehouses. Uh, we hear folks talking about artificial intelligence, that all that streaming, all of that storage has to be stored somewhere. Yeah. And the cloud, as we know, is not in the sky. It's a building with floors of servers and more floors and floors of more and more servers. Air conditioner. And so <laughs> I like REITs, not just because I work for the REITs, but also because it's also a very really good investment vehicle. And it's a way in which you can invest in real estate mm -hmm. without having to deal with the hassle of First. everyday landlord management. Absolutely. Well, and I'm also glad that you brought up a little bit of like the role of now financial technologies and lending. Um, I think that's a space that, you know, probably won't delve into too much in this, but worth thinking about because when it comes to like wealth and access to financial services, oftentimes you'll see alternatives pop up that, you know, say that they're providing access. But I think one important thing for this audience and for policymakers to really just make sure that they're understanding is yes, access is important, but does it come with conditions that undermine the benefits? And that's where it's important for policymakers, for folks to just do the research, like access, good, but make sure it's like a product that is actually leading to maybe same quality terms, lower interest rate. Like those are the types of questions to kind of get you to that like second stage, making sure it's a quality product or service. Um, jumping into the next question related, um, what do you think policymakers can do at either the local, state, or federal levels of government to help Latinos build wealth? And what about the private sector? So I don't know if maybe Jose, you wanna jump in on this one. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a number of things. You know, one of the things that obviously is, is very much in the foray and discussion nowadays is housing affordability, right? Um, we know chronically, you know, for decades now, we've underbuilt homes, essentially. You know, it's a supply side issue. Mm -hmm. um, in many ways, our, our business is predicated on the fact that there is you know, underutilized spaces of homes, right? That people are especially, you know, like for example, empty nesters were some of our post, first hosts on Airbnb. Um, now it's become a bit more mainstream and we have all kinds of folks that are hosting on the platform. But I think one of the things, for example, that we've been focusing on for the past, I'd say year, year and a half, last November, we launched a, a program called uh, Airbnb Friendly Apartments. So uh, this essentially opens up the ability for renters in partnership with their landlords, mm -hmm. uh, Graystar and a couple other uh, big landlord um, and developers are partners in this to be able to open up this income stream for them to you know, lessen essentially the, the rent burden so that they can then save that difference or do whatever it is, you know, uh, a path towards home ownership. So I think legislation at the local 
level that really focuses on, on, on tapping into that ability to generate additional income for more people, specifically renters, is mm -hmm. something that uh, I, I don't think a lot of people are really thinking about, but I think is, is, is vital to you know, create that path of homeownership for, for many more people. Um, I'll, I'll offer yeah. up, um, <clears throat> there's a, a program, um, special purpose credit program that uh, nice. SPCP you might hear of. Um, and so we, we offer it as do other uh, banks. It's uh, unique because usually it's either FICO, uh, your DTI, the, the collateral, why you are um, either accepted or declined for a mortgage. Um, with the special purpose credit, it allows lenders to go either um, direct that activity or the, the outreach of the product to specific people mm -hmm. um, and or uh, specific areas. Um, and that's really what's needed to get to the, our target audiences. When we uh, launched the special purpose credit, we started with refinances on our uh, book of business. Interesting enough, it wasn't because people applied and were declined for the refinances. They didn't think they could uh, be accepted, so they just didn't um, apply for the refinance. So um, when we sent out the offer, folks didn't believe it. So mm -hmm. then they got the offer, then they didn't believe it, um, and so we had to redo the whole marketing to make sure it was uh, FedEx and it wasn't through US Mail, mm -hmm. that we had a landing page with our CEO greeting them when they, when they went there. Um, so it's just interesting the lack of education or belief that they could get something like that. But with the special purpose credit program, um, it's not new. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that it's new. It's actually been available for 40 years. Uh, but lenders were very hesitant to go into it because of the risk of buyback. Mm. Um, the the risk of um, un, uh, not firm guidelines around it. So legislators should and, and can encourage more of that if there's more clear guidelines for lenders that if they're doing this, they're doing the right thing, and that there's some security for them for you know that buyback. Absolutely. I don't know, Rafael. I think when we talk about policy, we we have to realize the reason there is a disparity, the reason there is a wealth gap is because it was by design. It mm -hmm. was designed that way, right? So the back in you know, the early 1900s, there, there was policies put in place to make sure that home ownership was accessible to white homeowners and it locked everybody else out. So that was done primarily by zoning ordinances and, and trying to keep the character of communities, as, as was mentioned earlier. Absolutely. Um, so when we start looking at, well, where's the policy solutions, I think the solution lies in the same policies that created the issue, that created the lack of opportunity, that created the, the lack of building uh, home, homes for home ownership. Um, the National Association of Realtors has a study, and I think it was 5.5 million is the amount of shortage. We're at a 50-year high of, of shortage of home ownership. Wow. And I think that's a lack of a four trillion dollar investment that hasn't been made, right? So I mean, there's there's a lot of work to do, but the gap is so large that anything that creates more inventory, more housing, more home ownership mm -hmm. is where the solution lies. And I think, you know, if you look at neighborhoods pre 1920s, there was a diverse type of housing. There was small houses next to big houses and apartments and fourplexes and cottages. Right, and otherwise known as that that missing middle, and and I think the policies that open that up create more affordable home ownership types, which then opens up the door to people who are either barely mortgage ready or almost mortgage ready, meaning they're they're almost able yeah. to qualify. They just need something a little more affordable. So I think that's where on the local level and state level, you know, zoning changes. Like in, I'm from California, where there's been a lot of work done in the accessory dwelling unit space. Um, and if the, you then look at the federal level, um, back in April, HUD announced that they're, um, it, it's, it was a, a draft of, of a memo, but that draft basically says that they're looking to now allow the, the future rent or the projected rent of an accessory dwelling unit as qualifying income. Mm -hmm. So that means that somebody who may not otherwise qualify with that extra income, it puts them over the edge. And back to housing affordability and affordable housing, you know, that creates that affordable home ownership opportunity. But also for 
whoever's going to be living in that accessory dwelling unit also creates an affordable housing type. Mm -hmm. uh, just some other policy areas um, that, you know, where NAR has sponsored some, some bills is an expansion of credit, right? A lot of Latinos have non-traditional credit types. They don't believe in credit cards. So being able to expand the ability for credit reporting to accurately reflect that these are responsible borrowers that pay their bills. Um, you know, it's just one example of areas where at the, at the federal level there could be policy that's being worked on to expand those opportunities. Absolutely. It's important to look at what one is providing from a value added proposition standpoint. You may say, well, what do I mean by that? When you look at the rugged transformation that is happening in our economy today through artificial intelligence, through uh, automation, what you see happening right now in Michigan with the workforce stoppage there or in Hollywood with the strike there, the labor force and labor leaders are asking how, what would be our future as artificial intelligence, as automation comes sweeping in and transforming our economy. And I think it's really important to look at what jobs in our communities cannot be replaced mm -hmm. by artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and the new high tech economy and what jobs are there to be taken advantage of in the future as we go through this uh, transformation of our economy? Because that's going to be a real question that needs to be asked. Number two, I would also say that there is this important fact, $69 trillion in private equity and venture capital investment in this country today. 1.3% actually go to women or minority owned business. 1.3? Businesses. 1. I was looking for the number yesterday. 1.3%. 3% out of $69 trillion. These are investments made by pension funds, by uh, savings plans, by retirement funds that everyone here, a large, folk, yeah. large group here, and your parents have put into, especially public service workers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, firefighters, police officers, custodians, uh, hotel workers, and those funds that are not controlled by people who look like us mm -hmm. do not fund projects that are run by people who look like us. Absolutely. And so you can build all the political power you have, but if you don't have the economic power to match, then you're still gonna be at the whims of those who have the most influence. Yeah. And finally, it's important to understand that those opportunities happen when they actually get funded, mm -hmm. right? Because that also leads to other small businesses getting funded as well. As well. And that's what creates the opportunity. And from a policy perspective, in the, whether in the private sector or in the public sector or in the nonprofit sector, sometimes when we get in the room, there are those of us who get silent. Mm -hmm. And when we're the only ones in the room, we have to speak up because no one is going to do it if we're not the ones. And it may get uncomfortable. And I know some of y'all may be here with your bosses today. And super, I get it. <laughs> At some point, when we do build up that um, that leverage, we actually have to use it Absolutely. to help advance those in our community who are not in the room. Absolutely, right. keep opening those doors, speak up, um, and it's hard. It's definitely hard. And what I appreciate about you know all of your responses, they're so different, so diverse, and all so important. Uh, I would just add that another way to also think about it and what I actually really appreciate is usually a lot of like wealth and finance conversations are about, are about like what an individual can do, but it's so much bigger than that. And that's why I really appreciate the focus on systems, on policies, on the actions of public sector and private sector. They have a role to play in this as well. And so thinking about it from a methodical perspective, like you can literally attack asset by asset, debt type by debt type to really advance wealth for not just Latino communities, for other communities as well, black communities, other marginalized communities. Um, I'm thinking about like, you know, there's so much, we haven't really touched on debt, but like student loan debt, like that's a huge issue. That is very much tied to our ability to, to build wealth. Um, but it, it goes across all asset types, all debt types, there are policy solutions, private sector solutions to each. Well, um, you, yes. just, you, you mentioned it about people like us in, in rooms. Um, in financial services, in the mortgage industry, it's less than 10% diversity of pr practitioners. Mm -hmm. And then when you start looking yep. at it by segment, Hispanic, Asian, or, or black, it's single digits. So we don't have enough people that are serving our community Absolutely. that understand our community. Also the um, appraisers. So um, the appraisers are, you know, back in the years, uh, 
uh, you know, during the Great Recession, the issue was that people were getting their homes, they were over appraised. Mm -hmm. um, now the issue is that they're being under, uh, under appraised. Yep. And uh, Hispanic and black houses are uh, mostly under uh, appraised. So we need diversity that, uh, of appraisers in our communities that know our communities. We need diversity in uh, the workforce so that they understand uh, multiple, multiple generational families living together mm -hmm. where income uh, is pooled. Uh, that's also a big need. And just one quick thing. We're not asked to be given anything. Right. You know, we, we come from communities where people hustle, they work, they take we care of their relatives a hundred percent, right? Yeah. What we want and should demand, especially when we, again, we talk about retirement funds or pension plans that mm -hmm. we're putting our money into mm -hmm. is the equalization of opportunity. Yes, right? exactly. We're not asking for the equalization of outcomes, opportunity, and that's where the accountability and holding people accountable is very important. Absolutely. No, I really, you want to add to it? No, this is good. Uh, this is where everyone's passionate about this. You know, and going back to, well, we talked about what we could do for policy, but for private industry, right? I think we have a room full of people who are either already at the table or will be at the table. Right? And when you're at the table, I, I think a lot of times we have a unique perspective and all of a sudden the word equity comes up and, you know, it's, it's not just sprinkle some equity on it and we're good, right? It's, well, well, what is equity? It's like, well, there was a historical injustice and now we need to overcompensate to make things right. Mm -hmm. And if you're not at that table, you know, reminding people that that's what equity is, a lot of times it does turn into, well, throw some equity into the language and we're good, right? And I think being at the table is like, well, time out, right? No, the reminder, this is how we got here. Let's come up with real solutions. And those are really empowering, right? Or like building up from the community and not just saying it, but actually doing it, right? Like there's programs out there where people are training developers of color to go in and be the developers in the community, right? Yes. There's empowering programs out there where people are, are actually empowering people from the community to build for the community mm -hmm. instead of sprinkling some equity on it. So I think it's real important to, to speak up in a meaningful way and, and say, no, no, time out. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and, and if I can, just to, just, just to um, follow up on some of the points that were raised, I think you know, we, we speak on the, the, the more macro, the policy and the implications for individuals. But I think one thing that's super important as well, and I'm sure it's true for everyone here in this room, is reminding ourselves that like, every time I meet, for example, a host on Urban I, I they all have their unique stories, but there's commonality throughout, right? And, and to John's point, like they're all in some form or another sort of trying to make it hustling, right? Um, and yeah, it's in, in important that interplay between the policy and the mm -hmm. implications for the individual, but also very important to carry through the experiences that we all see in our communities to make sure that they're ever present in the policymakers' minds. Absolutely. So I was gonna say, it was just really fascinating hearing all of the, God, you had such great insights. One of the things that I always love to learn is, you know, what are your go-to resources for learning about finance, economics, economic policies. We could just do it like a round, like a quick round um, to, before we get into uh, audience Q&A. So like, for example, I love listening to Odd Lots podcasts. I read Morning Money. I read the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal, the business sections. Um, I don't know if you want to kick it off next. Um, so uh, I'm a member of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Um, it's not uh, it, it started as a real realtor group, but it's all uh, financial. Um, but that's a great place. They uh, every year, <clears throat> excuse me, they have they publish the um, state of Hispanic housing, mm. and they also have a report of um, Hispanic wealth project. Mm. So uh, it's a very easy read, a very informative read to ground yourself in our community and everything relating to housing. Awesome, John. Sure. Um, in addition to my work with Nayreed, I serve on the editorial board for real estate innovation uh, magazine called PropMoto. So I spend uh, the morning re using reading clips on their website. I read, uh, move on from there to the Wall Street Journal, uh, New York Times, uh, Property, Port, Property Report as well. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, spend a lot of time on, um, when I want to understand a company, I like to look at their, a public company, I like to look at their diagnostics. Mm -hmm. right? So I read their 10K reports. 
and Those I go on the SEC <laughs> and I read their filings, usually yeah. their quarter filings, because you get a good understanding of the company, the threats they're facing, challenges, obstacles, um, uh, profits, revenues, and future And not outcomes. a lot of people dig into those, so that's awesome. <laughs> so highly recommend. <laughs> yeah, one, one resource that I love is called Planetizen, like Planet Citizen, and it's on YouTube. It's like open source urban planning courses, and I didn't get a degree in urban planning, so I'm self-taught, got to go on there, and it's free, and it's on YouTube, so that's one. Uh, and also, uh, the National Association of Realtors has great research, so the website's nar.realtor, but if you go to research, there's a ton of data there, uh, down to your congressional or state level, district or, or state, um, and we could also work with people to provide that data in a, in a tailored way if what you're looking for is not there, so um, yeah, nar.realtor under research has a ton of uh, great information. Yeah, okay. I, just, I just want to call out both the NAREF report that Ms. Maria mentioned and the NAR report that Rafael just mentioned are amazing. I think I've learned so much from looking at those and they're definitely part of my uh, go-to now, but uh, just generally, I Financial Times is a great resource. Yeah. Uh, I don't I think dive into as many 10Ks as John does, but <laughs> those are fascinating, you know, if you can put up with the weird formatting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Lots of newsletters and podcasts. One that I absolutely enjoy is um, uh, Scott Galloway. I'm sure oh, about. Yeah. Uh, he he has like very interesting takes on sort of macro uh, trends. And uh, lastly, on more like urban planning and housing, there's some great YouTubers out there. Uh, it's a great medium. There's one called Not Just Bikes, which mm. the channel name is uh, I think a bit misleading. It's not just about bikes, hence the name. Um, but it's uh, lots of urban planning, zoning issues, and things like that. I probably watched too many of those videos, to be honest with you. But yeah. Awesome. Ur like you had Urban Institute. Oh yeah. Urban. And then uh, Harvard Center um, Joint uh, Joint ha Center for Housing. Yes, I thank so. you. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Harvard Joint <laughs> Center for great. Housing Studies. Yes. Absolutely. And then I'll um, you know say it's Brookings. But oh. <laughs> I actually have a recent report on Latino wealth. If folks are interested, like brand new. Um, Ooh, okay. So I actually would love to turn it uh, over now to audience questions. Oh, we've got a question. We'll start over here. Oh, you got a mic. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We'll start here and then come over here. <coughs> oh, sorry. Hi, um, I'm Yvette Rivera. I I'm at the U.S. Department of Transportation. I do civil rights transportation uh, policy work. Uh, one thing I wanted to introduce into the mix is transportation costs mm -hmm. and how they factor for yeah. uh, first-time homeowners and homeowners, especially the farther you get away from uh, your, your 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 job or your or, or school. It's just prohibitive. Uh, it starts to uh, impact your ability for home ownership. And that's something that, you know, I think, <clears throat> I think John, you were talking about how transportation is one of the, the infrastructure uh, stories that created segregation and, and destroyed uh, uh, black, especially black communities and brown communities across the nation. So um, it's so important to uh, get involved in transportation discussions and planning uh, so that, uh, you know, those impacts are uh, not, you know, so negative on, on black and brown communities. And we have laws uh, that, that are, you know, ha have been on the books uh, forever. And so here at USDOT, we're really trying to be as proactive as possible to ensure that, um, you know, that this planning is, is, a, is as equitable as possible. And, uh, but it's something that, you know, we need the whole of the public to be involved. And, you know, often with the advocacy groups, everyone talks about education, jobs, uh, immigration. But, you know, out of that discussion, often, off, often not discusses transportation and, and, uh, and that, ha that uh, has to be changed. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for sharing that comment. I, don't know. Yeah, I think one of the things I've, I've heard in my real estate career is drive until you qualify. Right. The further you get, the, the more affordable things become. And then there's that, that inverse result of now people are driving, commuting, spending less time with their families. And 
it goes back to the importance of transit-oriented urban infill projects and how important those are. Thank you. Um, oh, you have a question over here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Kim Ramos. I work for Ponce Bank, which is a community bank located in New York City. Um, we only have 13 branches, but what I wanted to bring up is about financial literacy, yeah. which I don't think was discussed enough today. And for us, we call it financial mastery because we don't, our people aren't illiterate, right? So it's not about literacy, it's about mastery. So what my question was really about how important financial mastery is at all stages of life we should have it multiple times at different venues um, by different people. We do it at the bank. We offer it from school, right? You want high schoolers who know how to go into college, college students who know how to manage their debt when they're in their student debt in college, people who want to buy a home, people who want how to budget, how, to, how it impacts their credit ratings. And I guess my, my call to action for the panel and for everybody in this room is how do we get that out there? How important it is to get these financial mastery courses, I haven't coined the, the phrase, but we should, should be financial mastery at every stage of your life. How do you then get all the, your children to learn how to budget, right? We don't have passbooks anymore. We have, we have kids who are on their, on their cell phones. Everything is getting more digital. So it's really about uh, asking the panelists, how do we get that out there more often? How do we have that discussion? How do we tell everybody in this audience that they should be having these discussions regularly with their families, with their teenagers, with their college students, so that they are prepared for their financial futures. If I could answer that really quick. Um, great question. Too many students will get a high school diploma not understanding what the difference is between an asset and a liability. And I think it's in, incumbent upon uh, states and municipalities to mandate that financial education be taught to children. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of people in this audience who have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad four or five times. And financial literacy is something that I embed in my 12-year-old son and have from its infancy. But all the financial education in the world, in our communities, is not going to change the status quo. And I go back to the fact, $69 trillion in venture capital and private equity, 1.3% goes to minority-owned and woman-owned businesses. So the financial education is, 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 is paramount. It is essential. But with that still comes the uh, accountability. You can read all the self-help books yeah. in the world, but you actually don't make any change. Yeah. It's, not gonna, it's not gonna change the status quo. So I agree, it's essential, but we can't let back on accountability. Yeah. Yeah. But you have wonderful, incredible, ed educated leaders within this community who are still not given the opportunity that should be afforded to them, yeah. right? It's a, it's, so it's still about accountability. It's a, it's a and, right? Exactly. It's not, it's not either or. It's an, yeah, it's an and. Um, but we, uh, that's a very valid point. No, we didn't touch on that. Um, we still have, we're still working with people that believe that they need 20% down payment to get into a home. Um, and so, or that they need, you know, pristine credit. Um, there's so much, um, you know, myth around it. So we definitely need uh, more. And we and we can't be everywhere, uh, every, you know, at every time. So we have to amplify through community partners. So we partner with uh, organizations like Unidos or the Urban League or other nonprofit organizations and market because we need them to help us bridge that gap. Absolutely. And I think just to add to the point that, you know, he was making it, it's one of those things where sometimes like you can do everything right, get all of the education, um, get the degrees, and there's still research that shows that you will encounter discrimination yeah. along the way. And so that's why it can't be either or like, yes, educate yourself, but also even distinct from financial education is access to information in the first right. place. Yeah. because it has to be quality information. Um, and so all of it's in interconnected, so we really appreciate the comment and, and obviously the contribution. Uh, Rafael. And I would just add, you know, it starts at home, at the dinner table. I think in many Latino families, there's a taboo of talking about finances amongst anybody. And, you know, I, I've seen programs in our local community where organizations are connecting with the school boards and starting financial literacy courses in the schools. So those kids then go home and have a you know, talk with their parents and they're like, oh, we don't talk about it. Well, 
once they start asking the questions, you can't close that door, right? So I think, you know, it really starts in the schools and at home. Absolutely. And I know you had a question. <laughs> Do we have the, can we bring the mic over? Thank you. So, hi, my name is Arturo Montoya. Uh, this is more of a hypothetical policy question. It may be a little <laughs> kind of extreme, but um, with the push together. for people to own homes, um, is the thought or has the thought come up about, you know, uh, allowing people or working with the private sector uh, to allow people to uh, work more remotely if their job allows it in order for them to maybe purchase a home that's a lot further away from a downtown? Or is that something that would maybe cannibalize all the investments that um, are in downtown and businesses there. I'm from LA, so uh, if you guys can imagine you know, people you know, moving to the Inland Empire, San Bernardino, Riverside County, how realistic could, could that be? Or is that a hard, like, no, not likely to happen? Y'all are the housing experts. <laughs> I, look, you know, I've done some writing on work from home. I believe when you, all options have to be on the table, right? In order to have effective solutions and our, workforce has gone through a dramatic change, obviously, with the uh, since COVID. Um, is it necessary for people to be in the office Friday, 9 a.m.? Not everybody, probably not. And so I do believe the hybrid workforce, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, is going to become uh, more of a reality. I understand the benefits of work from home. I understand the challenges and that we don't provide enough for childcare here. And so mm -hmm. sometimes people have to be at home, yeah. especially with their kids. We also have to look at the impact that 100% work from home will have on black and brown communities and those same black and brown small business owners who operate around offices. We have to look at the opportunities for so many that have come actually from being in the office. And there are a lot of people who have jobs that will never be able to work from home. And I think that demonstrates how work from home is not beneficial to all. It's mostly beneficial to those who are the most educated, have the most money in their, in their pocket, and also have the ability to actually have the space in their home. My mom could not work from home or my father because you know there were police sirens outside. You don't want that on a Zoom. They didn't have an office in the house, right? We had relatives just showing up out of nowhere for no reason, right? I want that on a Zoom, right? So I think we just have to understand the, the across the board impact that it doesn't impact everyone equally, but all options have to be on the table. Well, okay, so I apologize because, you know, we can go on and on about this topic forever, but I want to invite the panel to say, you know, to share any like short closing remarks before we leave. And I don't know, maybe Jose, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, look, I think uh, much to the, the point on transportation, financial literacy, they're all part of the, the mix, right? Um, so, you know, though the conversation definitely focused a lot on home ownership in this panel, it's not, a, you know, a, a, a panacea, right? Absolutely. I think it's, it's a, as uh, Luz Maria pointed out, it's an and, right? So it's, it's all of these things. And I think conversations and forums like this one are incredibly important to make sure that we are touching on these subjects. I know, like Rafael has mentioned, definitely money was taboo uh, subject in, at the dinner table growing up, but I, I still brought it up. I was probably the, the most annoying kid at the <laughs> table. Um, but, you know, that's not the experience that we all have necessarily. So, you know, just, just want to say that I think it's, a, you know, I, I see it every day when, when I talk to hosts. We're all trying to better and improve the lives of our, of our for ourselves and, and for our families. So um, I'm, I'm just grateful to be here and have this conversation with, with the panel. And I would just say that, you know, a lot of the conversations around the country around, you know, affordable housing tend to focus on one 200 unit building. Uh, I would just challenge everybody to flip that on its head and look at 200 one unit developments where everybody gets a piece of the pie and everybody has an opportunity. And I think that would be a, a much more empowering paradigm for us to start looking at is, you know, 200 units instead of one 200 unit building because it, it shares the wealth and empowers more people in our communities. It's incumbent that we support uh, those in our community who actually have reached in a reasonable, accountable way, financial success. Sometimes we can be judgmental of those who made their success that is JP Morgan or working for a read or working for a bank. And we have to understand that um, we don't have that luxury, okay? We 
not to be divisive in that way, but we didn't have parents in many cases that were members of country clubs, right? That had the trust funds at their ability, right? Went to private school, had all options at the table, and then now they can be, we could just be, you know, judge and say folks aren't pure enough yeah. for us. We, those who are accountable and have reached financial success in our community, we need to support them, help them, be honest with them, but they should be held, those men and women, as uh, people who have done it the right way and models of success. Mm -hmm. Great point. Great. Um, I would just say if, if, uh, if it's you or friends or family that are pursuing home ownership to um, actively look for answers, bust the myths, uh, do your research. There are many programs uh, available that go underutilized. So I um, encourage you all to keep digging and keep looking for answers. They're there. Well, thank you so much. Another round, first, maybe one round of applause <laughs> for our esteemed <Steve> <laughs> Um